The following is an excerpt from Lamentation by Ken Scholes. Windweir is a city of paper and robes and stone. It crouches near a wide and slow-moving river at the edge of the named lands, named for a poet turned pope, the first pope in the new world, a village in the forest that became the center of the world, home of the Andro Francine order and their great library, home of many wonders both scientific and magical. One such wonder watches from high above. It is a bird made of metal, a gold spark against the blue expanse that catches the afternoon sun. The bird circles and waits. When the song begins below, the golden bird watches the melody unfold. A shadow falls across the city and the air becomes still. Tiny figures stop moving and look up. A flock of birds lift and scatter. The sky is torn and fire rains down until only utter darkness remains. Darkness and heat. The heat catches the bird and tosses it farther into the sky. A gear slips. The bird's wings compensate, but a billowing black cloud takes an eye as it passes. The city screams and then sighs seven times, and after the seventh sigh, Sunlight returns briefly to the scorched land. The plain is blackened, the spires and walls and towers all brought down into craters where basements collapsed beneath the footprint of desolation. A forest of bones, left whole by ancient blood magic, stands on the smoking, pockmarked plain. Darkness swallows the light again as a pillar of smoke and ash blots out the sun. Finally, the golden bird flees southwest. It easily overtakes the other birds, their wings smoking and beating furiously against the hot winds, messages tied to their feet with threads of white or red or black. Sparking and popping, the golden bird speeds low across the landscape and dreams of its waiting cave. Chapter One Rodolfo Wind swept the prairie sea and Rodolfo chased after it, laughing and riding low in the saddle as he raced his gypsy scouts. The afternoon sun glinted gold on the bending grass and the horses pounded out their song. Rodolfo savored the wide yellow ocean of grass that separated the ninefold forest houses from one another and from the rest of the named lands. It was his freedom in the midst of duty, much as the oceans must have been for the seagoing lords of the elder days. He smiled and spurred his stallion. It had been a fine time in Glimmerglam, his first forest house. Rodolfo had arrived before dawn. He'd taken his breakfast of goat cheese, whole grain bread, and chilled pear wine beneath a purple canopy that signified justice. While he ate, he heard petitions quietly as Glimmer Glam's steward brought the month's criminals forward. Because he felt particularly benevolent, he sent two thieves into a year's servitude to the shopkeepers they'd defiled while sending the single murderer to his physicians of penitent torture on Tormentor's Row. He dismissed three cases of prostitution and then afterward hired two of them onto his monthly rotation. By lunchtime, Rodolfo had proven Atero's theory of compensatory seduction decidedly false, and he celebrated with creamed pheasant served over brown rice and wild mushrooms. Then with his belly full, he'd ridden out with a shout, his gypsy scouts racing to keep up with him. A good day, indeed. What now? The captain of his gypsy scouts asked him, shouting above the pounding hooves. Rodolfo grinned. What say you, Gregoric? Gregoric returned the smile and it made his scar all the more ruthless. His black scarf of rank trailed out behind him, ribboning on the wind. We've seen to Glimmerglam, Rudaheim, and Friendslip. I think Paramo is the closest. Then Paramo it is. That would be fitting, Rodolfo thought. It couldn't come close to Glimmerglam's delights, but it had held on to its quaint, logging village atmosphere for at least a thousand years, and that was an accomplishment. 
They floated their timber down the Raj Blood River, just as they had in the first days, retaining what they needed to build some of the world's most intricately crafted woodwork. The lumber for Rodolfo's manors came from the trees of Paramo. The furniture they made rolled out by the wagon load, and the very best found its way into the homes of kings and priests and nobility from all over the named lands. He would dine on roast boar tonight, listen to the boasting and flatulence of his best men, and sleep on the ground with a saddle beneath his head. The life of a gypsy king. And tomorrow he'd sip chilled wine from the navel of a log camp dancer, listen to the frogs in the river shallows mingled with her sighs, and then sleep in the softest of beds on the summer balcony of his third forest manor. Rodolfo smiled. But as he rounded to the south, his smile faded. He reined in and squinted against the sunlight. The gypsy scouts followed his lead, whistling to their horses as they slowed, stopped, and then pranced. Gods, Gregoric said. What could cause such a thing? Southwest of them, billowing up above the horizon of forest line that marked Rodolfo's farthest border, a distant pillar of black smoke rose like a fist in the sky. Rodolfo stared and his stomach lurched. The size of the smoke cloud daunted him. It was impossible. He blinked as his mind unlocked enough for him to do the math, quickly calculating the distance and direction based on the sun and the few stars strong enough to shine by day. Wind where, he said, not even aware that he was speaking. Gregoric nodded. By general, but what could do such a thing? Rodolfo looked away from the cloud to study his captain. He'd known Gregoric since they were boys, and it made him the youngest captain of the Gypsy Scouts at fifteen, when Rodolfo himself was just twelve. They'd seen a lot together, but Rodolfo had never seen him pale before now. We'll know soon enough, Rodolfo said. Then he whistled his men in closer. I want riders back to each of the houses to gather the wandering army. We have kinclave with Windweir. Their birds will be flying. We'll meet on the western steps in one day. We'll be to Windweir's aid in three. Are we to magic the scouts, General? Rodolfo stroked his beard. I think not. He thought for a moment. But we should be ready, he added. Gregoric nodded and barked out the orders. As the nine gypsy scouts rode off, Rodolfo slipped from the saddle watching the dark pillar, the column of smoke as wide as a city, disappeared into the sky. Rodolfo, lord of the ninefold forest houses, general of the wandering army, felt curiosity and fear dance a shiver along his spine. What if it's not there when we arrive, he asked himself. And he knew, but did not want to, that it wouldn't be and that because of this, the world had changed. We hope you've enjoyed Ken Skoll's Lamentation, a Macmillan audiobook from Tor Forge Books. Look for the full audio program to be released on February 17, 2009.